Hi, I'm Tom Harr. I'm the pastor at Calvary Presbyterian Church in Allenwood, New Jersey, just south of the New York metro area. And as I was looking through some of the other names of the folks who were invited to do these little videos, I'm pretty sure how I ended up getting included. You know how sometimes you're writing out an email and you're sending it to a lot of people at the same time and you're typing the addresses in the to field of your email and if they're in your address book it'll sort of pop up in a list and you hit enter and the name pops in. But sometimes as you're scrolling through the list you accidentally hit a wrong name and it goes in instead. And then after the invitation goes out of course it's kind of impolite to uninvite them. And as I look at the other folks with far more spiritual maturity, far more uh, spiritual understanding about so many things than I do, it's kind of incomprehensible that I would be included in the list. And somewhat ironic then, perhaps, that they asked me to talk about the incomprehensibility of God. The text on which the, uh, the, the idea is based is 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 27. This is Solomon at the dedication of the temple, and he says, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, how much less this house that I have built. In other words, Solomon's saying, I built a house for you, a temple, but it isn't as if it's something that can contain you because, God, you are uncontainable. The idea is found throughout Scripture. Uh, the psalmist speaks of the unsearchability of God. Job, of course, in the midst of his struggles and his pains and his questions, was humbled by the greatness and the sovereignty of God. In Isaiah chapter 55, the famous verse, is God says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. And of course, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 11 uh, says, Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how un inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? And the answer, of course, to that rhetorical question is no one. No one can know the mind of the Lord fully. And that's what this idea of, of the incomprehensibility of God is getting at. That we are unable to fully grasp God, either in his totality or fully grasp any of his individual attributes either. And now, why not? Why can't we grasp God in his, in his fullness? Well, first of all, because we're sinners. And that means that because of our own rebellion against God, our eyes are blinded to be able to see even that which is clear, clearly. And so for that reason, of course, we can't understand or know the things of God fully because we don't even see clearly that which is clear. But second, even without sin, we would be finite in comparison to an infinite God. Now that, of course, certainly leads us to a great degree of humility that's very, very appropriate. But I wonder, for some of us, do we feel as if that leads us to despair? In other words, does this mean that we can't know anything about God? Well, no, that can't be true, because if we can't know anything about God, we couldn't even know that he was incomprehensible. So we must be able to understand something about God. How does that fit together? Let me illustrate it like this. I used to work for Sunoco, a relatively large, medium-sized, maybe, oil company headquartered here in the northeast part of the United States. And the primary business for Sunoco was the refining of crude oil into products like gasoline and kerosene and heating oil. Now, one of the roles that I had when I worked for Sunoco was the director of investor relations which means that I was primarily responsible for communicating the strategy, the performance of the company to investors and analysts on Wall Street and around the country. Now, oftentimes what would happen is someone would call me and say, hey, we're thinking about investing in Sunoco. Can you explain oil refining to me? And so I would give it a go. I'd say, well, it's basically like this. Crude oil in and of itself is basically unusable. So you put it in a big tank and you heat it up until it gets really hot. So hot that it turns into a gas, a vapor. And as the vapor rises in the column of the pot, it cools as it goes. And as it cools, different products condense at different levels. And then you capture them and pull them off. And so the vapor rises and you pull off gasoline and you pull off kerosene and you pull off heating oil and voila, you have oil refining. Now, any chemical engineer who worked at Sunoco would absolutely cringe at an explanation like that because it doesn't come close to fully explaining what oil refining is. But nothing in what I said was actually wrong. And in almost all cases, 
it was completely sufficient for someone who was making an investment decision about whether or not they were going to invest in the company so that they could understand the basics of what it was that we did. The point is this, just because you can't understand something fully doesn't mean that you can't understand it truly. And just because we can't understand God exhaustively doesn't mean that we can't understand God rightly. In fact, we're commanded to know God. In Deuteronomy chapter 29, it says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed to us belong to us and belong to our children. So there is a distinction, even that God recognizes and says to us. There are secret things that belong only to him, but there are things that are revealed to us. And what's revealed to us is absolutely amazing. And what do we know? Well, we know that God is sovereign. We know that God is good. We know that he works in all things for his glory and for the good of his people. That's what a lot of these video devotionals are going to do over these coming days, is they're going to explain these different attributes of God that we can know and we can know truly even if we can't know exhaustively. Now, how do we know them? Well, we read about them in the pages of the Bible and we see them personified in the person and in the work of Jesus Christ. There's this exchange that Jesus had with one of his disciples. You might remember it from John chapter 14. Philip comes up to Jesus and says, Lord, show us the Father, and it's enough for us. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. When we look at the person and the work of Jesus, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we see truly the character of God. His justice, punishing sin, his love dying for us, and that which we know is absolutely amazing. So we can't know him fully, but we can know him truly. And for that, we should be amazingly thankful.